Jesus, Sri Mankar Jain, who is a graduate of IIA, who taught in numerous universities, has was instrumental in the first school content management in Irma, taught a lot of rural based uh, rural based courses in Irma, and uh, has done a lot in the in the field of education uh, from last 10, 18, 19 years. He has spent enormous time uh, starting from Ahmedabad to replicating this model in other parts of the state. So without wasting any time, sir, your chance. So how we have structured story is that each one of them will speak five to seven minutes on what they do, and then we'll have a session that will ask, we will ask questions. Thank you uh, for starting this note. I hope we see you at least focus our attention on most of the listeners. So thanks for the start. What we do is, uh, then I come with a background where people are known to talk more and do less. And following that, uh, we started with a journey where uh, we sort of rely on God to convert output into the impact. Which is what education is actually. The, we, we never know when the education is going to make an impact in your life, but, it, but everybody knows that it does make an impact. So, the way the field that we have chosen sort of is a smartly chosen <laughs> So that nobody asks the questions, what is the impact we are making? Other than we are probably helping uh, some people to become a little better capable to make the impact, whatever the impact they want to make in life. However, we are very sort of from the very beginning we were conscious uh, that these questions will be asked. So we decided that we must have some measure at least of output and if not the impact. Uh, and therefore, we have relied on. Uh, socially credible measures. They may not be appropriate measures, and there is a big debate in education what is a good indicator of good education. So what we have again found out in a convenient way that whatever the society considers good education, we will take that to be good education, whether it is good or not, let's not get into that kind of detail. And we then decided that how can we make uh, young children we work with acquire that good education which society considers to be good. So that's what is essentially the goal of our organization. Practically every school essentially does the same thing. So we are doing in some sense not anything different than what every school does in this country or all over the world. But what we then why did we exist? Why did we come into existence in the first place? I mean if everybody was doing and is doing, why should we exist? What we recognize uh, long back when we started on this journey, that unfortunately uh, the schools which are available to the children who do not have advantage of having a unable parental support are not getting to, let's say, capability to become good learner and they will make good impact in their lives. And such children needed to be provided a schooling which would enable them to have good education which will make impact in their lives. So we decided to work with such children and we tried to learn from the good schools what they do. And what we found out that the requirement of good schools are tough to assemble. Essentially, good school consists of a team of good teachers, headed by a good principal or head teacher or director or whatever you may like to call. And we recognize that there are just not adequate number of good teachers, and good principals or head of the team are still fewer. And therefore, this model of good schooling probably will not serve, and that's what has been happening for the last 20, 30 years. It's not that we don't have a school. These days, most of us know, practically every child is in a school in some sense. But the traditional model of schooling is not working. So we decided that we should find out a way whereby children can learn well, even without following this traditional model of good school, having a team of good teachers headed by a good principal. So our organization does nothing other than get out of this mode of good school and therefore just put, have a group of children, enable them to link up with somebody who is not really a good teacher by most of our common definition, or if there is no good principal per se, there is no principal in our system, and some of these children magically, they learn because God has enabled them to learn. So we as we say, God is our partner, both in generating output as well as promoting output into the impact. So God has enabled these children to learn well, and often this, we have been working with the children who are typically 
called so called first generation learner. Essentially, meaning that their parents are not educated and have to provide them support or compensate for the gaps that school is. See, most of us who belong to certain category, we have done well because our parents made sure that if there was a gap in our formal schooling, parents will take care of either themselves or tuition, whatever. Now, this facility is not available to large many children. So we work with such children and luckily, because God has given them capacity, these children are able to perform at the level of our children or the children of the people that like us. <coughs> so that's what we do. We want to work on some significant scale, but essentially work with the make children learn without having a team of good teachers and a principal. We work we started work in Gujarat in the city in Ahmedabad, no particular reason other than the fact that I am dependent on my wife and my wife had a job in Ahmedabad. They both started in Ahmedabad. Uh, we also living in Ahmedabad. So, but over the years we have so moved on to different cities in Gujarat, in UP, and Bihar, and also West Bengal for some time. Uh, the maximum children we educate in our program were around 45,000. Uh, we normally do not charge any fees from the children, so numbers depend upon the amount of money we are able to raise. So it's that true, it's still a change over time. This year we have around 25,000 children, not that large. Uh, so that's what we do. Uh, we also at times are called to work with the government schools to try to raise their learning levels and we have taken a couple of such programs. One which was relatively large, we work with almost half a million children in Bihar in government schools. So that's the other output so we see. Uh, we also were working in similar kind of arrangement with the government of Gujarat and possibly Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Or, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, our next, uh, uh, I hope the same uh, concept would have uh, been there when I was studying, then would have selected who the good teachers and bad teachers are class. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Nitin Pandit, uh, uh, who has enormous experience in this field of, uh, I mean, I know him from the field of energy access and energy. Uh, congratulations on your, on your new uh, avatar as the head of a a uh, previously for many years in WRI and then in, in before that at in the initiative of uh, International Institute of Energy Efficiency and the energy con conservation. So you have enormous experience across the world. Uh, Nathan, if you can bring in the, both the national and international uh, aspects of the outcomes versus outputs, the debate that's raging around the world and where has development uh, gone? And is it truly, are people really serious? Okay, so first maybe I'll talk a little bit about uh, ATRI, the organization, uh, for a few minutes. And uh, so ATRI stands for the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and Environment. And we're based in Bangalore, uh, and the organization is headquartered there, but we have what are called community conservation centers. Uh, about seven of them in uh, different parts of India, but primarily located in what are the two biodiversity hotspots of India, which are the Western Ghats and the Eastern Himalayas. Uh, these are biodiversity hotspots recognized by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, IUCN, as two out of the 13 hotspots around the world, which carries this amazing biodiversity, and they are currently under threat. Uh, for various reasons, mostly human intervention. But uh, so, ATRI focuses on the issues that surround ecology and environment. And one of the things that we look at is how does conservation and development, uh, how, how can it be balanced, how does it balance, how does it not balance, uh, what are the trade-offs that are involved when you look at uh, uh, ecosystems and the environment. Uh, it has been around for over about 25 years or so and one of the key things that we've done through our community conservation centers is to enable our researchers uh, and there are about 25 uh, senior faculty members and about 50 PhD students that we have. We do offer a PhD and they are typically in the field uh, related to these community conservation centers and they carry out long term research. It's not short-term project-based research per se, but it's long-term research. So we are able to provide input 
into policy making or negotiations and what have you, uh, which depend on long term data so that we know how our ecosystems are developing or not and how human society is being impacted. Uh, we also look at the concept uh, uh, from a theoretical perspective. So, do we, uh, we do a fair amount of deep science uh, through these faculties who have uh, amazing publications and research agendas and so on. Getting to the point uh, that uh, Harish was uh, talking about, um, I'd like to speak a little bit about, uh, you wanted me to compare sort of the international and the national and so on, and I think that's an important thing because having been on sort of both sides, international and national, as well as from the sort of the donor and, and the receiver uh, side of things, uh, it's really important to try and understand uh, who, who is your target audience? Uh, when you say impact, uh, who is your target audience? And so, uh, if for example, let's just take a look at a, uh, a simple classification uh, that we see in all the requests for proposals and things that come across uh, and some of the students will get to see as you build your careers. Um, you know, at the highest level there's impact. Then you have outcomes which lead to the impact potentially, and then there are outputs which are specific deliverables which lead to the larger outcomes. So it's a sort of a three-tier strategy, roughly speaking. Um, I actually like to think of it in, in a slightly different metaphor, and the metaphor is: think of the impact as the house that we all want to see. Let's say that there is, we assume, a collective conscious conscience that says that there is a house. The outcomes are the windows through which you look into that house. They give you a different perspective depending on which window you are looking into from the outside. And the outputs are the doors. They give you a view but you can actually walk through them. Okay? So just think about a house that you are looking at. When you look at an international donor, that international donor is essentially looking for the best bang for the buck. I'm, say, I'm spending so much amount of money, this is the impact I want to see, this is how I'm going to be judged by my peers and by my organization. So that's the, that's the window that the international donor looks at. I'm not talking about scale yet, but imagine if you were to scale that, it would be a different kind of in, impact, a different kind of outcome and a different kind of output that you would need to deliver to satisfy that end user that you are trying to satisfy. If you look at international NGOs, they look at it, you know, they're, they're, they're essentially organizations, but I might say they're looking for the door. Okay, they're looking for an entry, there are windows there, but they are trying to find a door into, into this house. They're trying to find a place where they can do work in India uh, so that they can meet their visionary objectives. And so, so they are always searching, they are changing from window to window depending on uh, the funds they have and so on. And then there are the international corporations who are looking at the window to ensure that there is no damage in the house. Okay, there is nothing happening because they also don't want to be damaged and there is no damage in the house. Now I am saying this again metaphorically because but you need to understand the concept behind this so that you can actually project this and move on. If I can take a minute more, in the Indian scenario, if you look at an Indian donor, then in that case they often feel, Yahamara Raja, this is my house. Okay? So you're looking at that's the window that they're looking in from. If you look at the Indian corporate, he's saying we've got a door. Okay? This is this is how things get done. Okay? That's the way in which they're looking at impacts, outcomes, and and the Indian NGO says, this is the window through which you must look. Okay. Each one of these provides a different perspective from which you look at the same house. Okay. So when you talk about outcomes and outputs, and then you talk about how do you scale them, you have to scale them with the metric for which your end user is going to use that metric. And so, it's the same house, but a very different number. 
Thanks, Nathan. I think uh, using your own metaphor, what is left today is that we have just built caves <laughs> and so on. So, my uh, honor to introduce Prema. She wanted to go last. So, I don't have to be blamed here. She wanted to go last. She, as we said, she comes from the same mafia as we all. Um, Prema, a long term friend who has an incredible sense of dry humor. Uh, which if you talk to her regularly and have dry humor, sometimes you are forced to laugh at her jokes uh, sometimes. But <laughs> incredible. <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, Prema uh, started in 1993 and uh, in the age of T20s, you basically are playing a test match in the whole world, in the whole era of social uh, entrepreneurship and, and, and development. I think from your own experience and especially how you brought, brought in the gender aspect truly, institutionalize that process completely over the last 27 years. It will be a pleasure to hear from you, your organization, and what is a little bit of advice on, on the outcomes and outcomes. The scale factor we will talk about. It. It's hard to it's hard to speak after Nitin's uh, professorial uh, speech and Harish completely on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> so, Swayam Shikshan Prayo is the organization that I um, started after the usual trajectory of um, doing a master's in social work. I went about to uh, unlearn everything I learned yeah, because it it, it did not. Uh, it did not really encourage me to start going and working with people. Yeah. So instead, I studied at a research institute, um, one of the first gender studies institute, and involved myself in research. But soon, um, I was very restless. Doing research on women in the uh, export processing industry led to uh, looking at very, very uh, depressing conditions that women work in. But I wanted to be involved in something where um, you actually look at not just the problems but the solutions. So uh, the organization that I started with like-minded professionals was <coughs> was and is called Spark, yeah? Sheila, with Sheila Patel and we started working with the payment dwellers in Mumbai and that's where I started my um, career and, and discovered that my passion was working directly with people because we started with a strong belief that in people and then, particularly women, that's where the solutions lie. And I think earlier in the day, all of us have heard, and especially the panel which has sent in, both the government and private sector said, there are enough problems and you need to identify not just what are the problems, but what are the opportunities and what we have done in the last uh, two decades to sum it up is, as an organization, look at us, ourselves as identifying opportunities for women to get involved, which would bring out their innovative and entrepreneurial spirit, but would also give them a, a long-term opportunity to get involved in Development. We've used various opportunity windows, starting with the um, Lakur earthquake and then repeat experiences after the Gujarat earthquake, tsunami in 2004, and then the floods, and now in Kerala. These have been, uh, these have popped up as, uh, as we discovered as opportunities for where, where the walls break. I mean, literally the houses are down, 
But these are also moments in time when the government is, uh, you know, in a crisis. People are in crisis, the government is in crisis. And everyone's looking for a pathway. And from this crisis, we found that the families support women to actually go out and work in the community. So our strategy has been to get women involved, not just in, we started with savings and credit groups after the reconstruction, but to take on new public roles. And I want to underline this, that when women come out of their houses and they take on roles in the community as they did after three or four disasters, these are opportunities empowering themselves and also the communities. So when they make a big difference, their respect and the way they are recognized in the communities goes up substantially. Because it's not, it's not the talk about how NGOs empower women, but how women empower themselves and how they are they play a very different role in their community. So the trajectory that we followed was looking at about 100,000 women. I'm now talking particularly Maharashtra, though we've expanded to uh, more than seven states. And these are very drought prone disaster. Disaster is the usual story every day. So in hostile conditions, these women have come out of their houses, started enterprises, and now more than 41,000 women, as of today, have broken barriers and they've been given a piece of land by their families. What is so innovative about this is that these 41,000 women have said no to sugarcane. And in saying that, they've said no to chemical-based farming. They've said no to uh, using a lot of water for farming. And they've said yes to moving to food crops and cultivating for the family to eat from the farm. This is a huge radical change. So I think this example and many such others where we were at one point involved with Harish to look at how can clean energy or solar energy be marketed by women as the frontliners? Now, this is completely a concept which is not there in the rural areas at the time we started 10 years ago. So, women, village level women, about 500 of them, actually started, and we started talking to private companies who manufactured these products. And we set up an organization, a private company, that aggregated women as a network. And we could, the weight of the network allowed us to dialogue with the private sector. So in our 20 years, we've uh, had part, long term partnerships with the government in scaling up our work. And we continue to do that in agriculture and enterprise. What seems to make the difference is that we make it very clear to the partners that the, this is a model where women are driving the change and we are providing technical support and creating platforms for dialogue and so on. I'll stop here. Yeah. Thanks, Prima. But I'll continue with you, Prima. You said, see, today if you look at gender equality in our country, um, it's 100 plus as far as the world ranking is concerned. Rwanda is at number four, right? And you worked here, as I said, like a test match for the last 26 years. Does it require, whether it's an urban prema or a rural prema, 26 more years to do that in different areas? Because if we have to catch up, right? and with the whole scale definition that people are coming up with, and increased disparity, and the pressure from funders, and pressure from the ground in terms of social unsustainability, what do you think is a highly replicable model that someone could pick up from SSP and say, oh, it's not, it will not require 26 more years for any other prema from Assam or Meghalaya or Manipur. What will it take for us to replicate the process and, and in a way that is sustainable? I think I'm going to say something which is very stereotypical. It requires a different mindset, yeah? It just uh, requires you to turn everything you know on the head. 
that um, women at the grassroots are uh, not beneficiaries. Whatever they are doing, if not, grassroots is not small. And just because they are um, not using the most fancy tech, that doesn't mean that they are not creating change which is sustainable. You know? So I think once you uh, start thinking, um, here are these women uh, who actually know what are the solutions to the problems they are facing in terms of nutrition, health, water, sanitation, because um, of their survival, everyday survival, they have to innovate. Yeah. So what we do is to lift up those innovations, support that, and allow them to be the leaders. So each of our leaders, like any name you take, Arjuna or Kamal or so on, they are the ones bringing up, they become the early adopters, educators, information providers and trainers and then role models and mentors. So they create a local ecosystem where each woman mentors, say in a year, at least 500 women. You know? I'm talking about, we have nearly 500 leaders who can do this. Of course, there are levels of leadership. So I think we're talking about a village level Saki who can actually mentor 100 to 150 farmers and that's how we've reached a scale of nearly 45,000 farmers today. Yeah. So she's really crucial and now the government is acknowledging the strategy and paying her. So we have about uh, 300 of these women resource persons who are farmers and who actually allow people to adopt and try out new practices. I think that's really important. Women need to try out their new roles. It's not a cookie cutter approach. It's decentralized, not centralized. <coughs> but I'll come back to you on just before that. It's a sorry, Nitin. I'm going to put you in a spot because I've not thought about this. Um, you've been in international think tanks who are very obsessed with processes, right? What she has said completely, saying that processes alone will actually will kill many of the innovation. It cannot be a cookie cutter approach. Larger institutions, larger funders, they say, but they want cookie cutter approach. And say, put it once in. That has not changed. We all do that. And then, for example, yesterday's budget, and hopefully we all have Chatham and Roots here, is, is that 98% of India has been has sanitation right now. Yesterday's newspapers, right? 98%. How many of you believe that we would have 98%? Right? Hmm. But, but nobody has challenged that. Right? The newspapers have reported, everybody, nobody is challenging that, right? Will larger think tanks actually come out challenging that or they're politically driven? So are, are the grassroots level organization stuck and there's a big gap between the think tanks like the WRI, the PricewaterhouseCoopers and the McKinsey's and the grassroots level. So the influence of the funders from large guys and have no voice from the grassroots level. Hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll use a different mic. Uh, uh, yeah, so the short answer to that one is that yes, there is a big gap. Okay. Uh, but I think you have to qualify that by saying again, if I use the metaphor, it is uh, if we are to believe people, then they are still looking for some impact. It may not be exactly the same, and so on. So at the end of the day, hopefully, one is looking for impact. Now, if you assume that, if you don't assume that, then it's not surprising that you have your differences. But if you assume that, then in that case, process, you know, comes a lot in the way. So I agree with that, that there is, that you have the jumping through those hurdles and the hoops of processes, uh, you know, often kills the initiative and the ability for people to actually interact and solve their own problems rather than looking elsewhere. Um, but it's not only the the difference in view between I think the international organizations and the local NGOs. Uh, it also has and why political correctness, right? So. Because politics exists, okay, and it is represented in some way 
you know, through whatever be your electoral processes and so on. So when you have an international organization and if they are led to believe that this is your representation, then it's, it's understandable that they would say that is your representation. So if a government says that 97% is, is achieved, and if, a, if an international NGO is led to believe that, even though I know a lot of them probably question it, but you can understand why they may not question it, or why the World Bank may say, we deal with governments because they are the representatives, and we have to believe the numbers that they give you. So process comes in the way, not only in terms of the transactional process, but the way in which these relationships are set up between, you know, who the what the delivery mechanism is and who the end users are. And that's where I think you have... So when you look for differences, it's not useful to, I think, say that there are differences because we know there are. But I think we have to understand the nature of the differences and as to why they exist in the first place. Good point, Nathan. I'll, I'll come, come back and say issue a bit. Uh, Angus, you've heard from um, Prema. You've worked in the field of uh, education. You know that, and, and there are a lot of youngsters, there are NGOs here, who are, and Lord, she might say that cookie cutter approach does not work, but you know there's pressures from other side. NGOs who are writing funding also have the same pressure. You have worked in very different states with your model. You said yeah. um, Rajasthan, Gujarat, UP, which are culturally very different places. Has there been any sort of standardization that you can actually say, yes, this is the same, or it's been completely different? If there are some funders sitting here, would they actually understand the nuances that you are going to? And because many of what you are going to say is relevant to the health industry also. Actually, there is, mm, it's almost identical. Uh, and in some sense, it may appear whatever we do is okay with it, in some sense. But the reality is that, see, let's say all three of us are from IIDs, and three of us, in some sense, but all of us are unique. Actually, each batch made was uniquely different. But there is still something which is common, which made us to uh, call the same IIT. So there is some commonality. And I think that commonality is absolutely necessary, functionally necessary in life. Each child is unique, that is a fact of life, whether he or she is educated or not. But whenever society expects education, for the matter any intervention, it expects some, some specific attributes to be produced in the field of education. And we have to grant that whether we like it or not. It may not be the perfect, we may have keep on disagreement that it is not the right attributes human beings should have. But society has to have that education would mean that a person who is educated will have attributes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It can be literacy, it can be numeracy, it can be capacity to solve the problem, etc., etc. But society expects you to have certain commonly accepted attributes, and we cannot run away from that. Now, there are, so that's on one side. So we have to understand that we have to deliver what society expects from whatever the institution there. That's number one. Second, of course, there are different ways to produce that output. is A, K has one way, IITM has a different way. So there are different ways to do it. But frankly, though each one is unique, there are a lot of similarities. The, the way IIT, or I am sort of a more uh, interesting I am currently, so each I am is different. Or for that matter, each school is different. Still, there is a lot of similarity among those who are performing well. Now, I would say that any well-performing system has, which works at some scale has to make sure that those aspects which make this each unique institution still good are there in all the places. And to that extent, it is cookie cutter. Making sure that there's those things which are necessary to make some desirable outcome are present at all the places that we want to work on. I am not sure cookie cutter is the right way to uh, describe it, but that is absolutely necessary. The question therefore comes, what are these requirements for making that desirable outcome, output, impact, whatever you may call it. In, in the field of education, frankly, as I said, the ultimately impact in terms of life really is intermediate between society, God, and a person. But 
at least in the area of education, numbers is taken as a surrogate measure of the impact. So you need to find out if we want to make an impact in terms of a large number of quote unquote education, I mean number of large number of supporting, just find out, analyze what is required, what is your way of delivering education as society concerns education, not what I consider. We may decide it, we are responsible to the society ultimately. So if we are able to deliver what society wants at large of scale, you will eventually actually find out that there are something common you have to make sure at all the places that you are. Now whether you want to, and so it is this is whole other personalization. So what happens in Bihar or let's say in one city of UP or other city of UP, in, at one level it's almost identical. But at the other level, each child is unique. So how do you combine that uniqueness of each child? There's something common among all the children who are undergoing the process of learning is the crux of the matter in designing a large system which is enabling this unique individual to still achieve something common out. Thanks, sir. Uh, it's uh, do you want to show the slide? No, no slides. Okay. No, so, so coming back to uh, what Pankaj said, Prema uh, is on one hand, yeah, it's it might be a little easier uh, in a very naive, I would say from my own naivety terms about comparing institutions. But when it comes to business models and delivery of essential services to the poor, where there are a lot of other cultural issues coming into needs, the way the needs are customized, the delivery of financial products are customized, the delivery of technical products are customized. Could you emphasize, again I, I will come back to the point because I, I still believe uh, I'm pushing you for a little more clarity, is would that change? Because the perception of gender is very different in other, other states. It might be a little easier, for example, in the southern states. Would you be able to achieve the same level of success if you started in a, in a place in UP, parts of conservative parts of Rajasthan, for example, or, or West Bengal? If that, how would you take that? I think... Uh, uh, the way, the way we worked and the uh, model really uh, looks at, for example, women getting, in, in farming it looks at women getting a piece of land. So that's a must. And it looks at uh, women moving out of their houses. So whether it's Bihar or Rajasthan, and we, we have successfully worked in Bihar, and we worked in Gujarat, Tamil Nadu, and now uh, we're working in Orissa and Assam. So, to that extent, I do feel that uh, the appeal of the strategy is that we look at uh, Swayam, which is basically looking at what what is the access to entitlements, assets, and rights that women can get, so they are self-empowered, and we uh, strongly include mobility and moving out of the house, exposure to market and other things in that. The impact is very different, of course, in each of the areas. So it, the impacts that we look for, say in a year or two, is basically that women become uh, decision makers in agriculture. They look at what crops to plant, what to sell, where to sell and how to do that. And get income in their hands. But also their uh, strong role of feeding the families and uh, the food crops they cultivate. So we look at that measure. But the main impact that we see is that they are as earners, they become decision makers. So whether agriculture or enterprise, when women start thinking, I'm the owner, I'm the farmer, I'm the enterprise owner, that makes all the difference to her and then to the family. But the shiksha, the education part has to be continuous. So without that, there's no long-term sustainability because then there are a couple of women and it's a spiral that keeps expanding. So the scaling up is basically bottom up. You know, it's not uh, top down, which is why I said it's not, um, as, as we go on scale, it's not uh, controlled from the top kind of approach. And innovation of course is key. So we pilot innovations through women 
and then we have leaders who have certain scale in time. I don't know if it answers what you are looking for. I'll ask the last question to you and then one more question to all three, a standard question and then we'll go back to the audience. If, uh, just to give a perspective so that people also, when, when people have come to this uh, classroom of uh, uh, after so many years, uh, it's good to be here because I, 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 sitting there is very nervous, uh, that's for me. Um, uh, <laughs> so the, the question to you, you are now taking in charge of A3. We know just to give a perspective of how do you at all measure outcomes and outputs in conservation, right? Tush, I mean it's where, how do you, this is a tough job, right? Because some things that you will do is beyond 20, 30 years that will actually be, I mean, in, in no pun intended, but full sense. But how do you look at uh, outcomes and outputs and so that that's a tough and that, that, that gives, that will give an answer to many of the answers and NGOs to relook at processes because conservation brings in a lot of processes for us to learn from. I'm going to give you a hard time for giving me hard questions. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So first thing, um, I think when you look at uh, from an NGO's perspective, or it is a curious NGO in that sense that we are a combination of academics and NGOs. Research and NGO. So it's a little different, uh, and I guess every NGO can have its own specialties and so on. And in fact, that's the point is that, uh, at least in my experience, and this is purely a personal observation, is that it's useful to, to sort of first stick to your core subjects um, and not to try and solve the whole problem. Uh, and when you do that, then it allows you to define your your metrics uh, of change uh, much more closely, and hopefully you can make them meaningful in the context in which they are applied. So, example, uh, you mentioned about uh, the sanitation part. Uh, another government figure is that uh, uh, you know forests are coming back. Okay, forests are coming back. Uh, you know there's all kinds of trees growing all the way, reaching the 33% forest cover very soon. Well, not exactly. Because we are close to about 21% in actually forest cover, which has the kind of diversity that a conservation organization would look at and say that this is where either restored or native forests are in terms of the quality of services and ecosystem services that they can provide. Uh, so the additional 10-12% is things like uh, monocultures, uh, plantations, uh, afforestation drives often made of a species that don't belong there. Okay? But that's to attain some objective of government policy, not necessarily ill-intended, but potentially ill-executed or in ill-informed in some ways. So when we look at our own, uh, not only impact, which would be long term, but the only thing that we can look at is sort of the mid-term outcomes, which would lead to that long term impact. So in our own space, we might say that we will monitor forests and actually decipher what that number means. So whoever is in the sanitation space should actually look at that 97 person number and like you said, stand up and say, wait a minute, there is there's an issue. So we would look at those numbers and actually clarify what they mean, monitor to what we know how to measure, and project that into the context of policy, into the context of statements that the government uh, or others come out with, and actually stand up and say that, wait a minute, you know, this is wrong, or in some cases the emperor has no clothes, or whatever be the case, right? So it's our job to actually try and do that. If we are able to do that successfully and put clarity on such statements, I think we would have achieved some level of impact over that. Thanks, thanks. thanks. My last question to all of you is uh, uh, 45, five more minutes, uh, each minute, couple of minutes. If Bill Gates each gave you $100 billion for your field to scale up, 
where will you put in the money? I think uh, without much thinking it would be uh, scaling up through people and in our case women. So you look at uh, how yeah, how can we build their capacities to uh, take on leadership which means create more and more leaders, other leaders. Yeah? And also look at how can they make a difference in some pretty intractable problems and issues that women face. For example, um, today we have a, yesterday we have a budget announcement and farmers is on top of the list, 12.5 crores of farmers. But none of them are women. So women who actually work on land, their own family land, are not recognized as farmers. Yeah? Because of the simple reason that they don't have land titles on their name. Yeah? So in our case, we have actually got 40, uh, 45,000 farmers who have got cultivation rights. Yeah? So it's not just uh, empowering women to take leadership in their communities to build networks of women, but simultaneously and together with that, they need to solve practical problems, whether it's around food security, around water, around nutrition or health or sanitation. So I would put the money definitely for us scale means um, networks, leadership and women leading change. Thank you very much. Two ecosystem where you'll put in the money other than entry and saying where will you that will change the ecosystem in what work you have well, I'm really disappointed you didn't mention the 1% commission that will go into my pocket, but uh, <laughs> but uh, any day on it that will pass my family. So you're saying how? <laughs> so you're saying where else would you put money? Okay. Um, okay, just again, based on my experience both on the international organization and comparing and contrasting where, like if we are 134th in some ranking, so the numbers are way down. So in order to sort of help in reviving that situation, um, one of the key things that I find that is different in India in particular um, is a complete lack on the technical side as well as the socioeconomic side of measurement systems. We measure nothing. Be absolute, and what you don't measure, you can't control. So, what I'll, I'll just repeat quickly one of the things that I find that's a huge lacuna in specifically the Indian system, as compared to the rest of the world that you can compare and contrast, is any aspect of a measurement system, whether it is technical measurement systems or river flows uh, or socio economic measuring systems of how gender can be actually included, what is the measure of an inclusive system, nothing, nothing. All us researchers are really scrambling to find good primary data and it is bloody frustrating. Okay? Because we find nothing that is meaningful in terms of a consistent measuring system that is for any aspect of life that can lead us to impacts. So if we don't have the measure, how can we even count it? So, if I had a hundred billion, which actually in the large scheme of things is not that much money in the sure. global budget, sure. the hundred billion could go really <coughs> nicely into establishing a comprehensive system of measurements across the Indian spectrum. Okay, sir. Well, is it, as it happens, actually, I have in fact proposed you know, probably something to actually Gates Foundation for a bigger money. And, uh, it is uh, it's also interesting, he led us to, I think, an important insight, which I would like to repeat, even at the cost of taking time, that response about where, what we lead to the impact will vary from field to field. The answer of that question is different for me, and different for me in education. We won't have one common answer. Surprisingly, in spite of each one is unique, they are still common. For example, the largest, the first priority which I have proposed to Gates Foundation, and for that matter, the government of India and government of Gujarat, which is trying to work on it, is the same thing. Set up a good measurement system of whether a child is learning or not. And importantly, make sure that that information is available to those 
who have capacity to impact child's learning. By and large, even when output is measured, it remains with somebody who doesn't know what to do. Okay, it goes to the minister, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, now, in case of child, so um, our requirement, one of the first priority was in spending money was make sure that there is a good way to assess whether the child has learned or not and make sure that that information is available to number one parent and the child. That would probably transform or put such forces into play which will eventually lead to the outcome. So that's one kind of thing. Second thing we have found out that at least in India as I started by saying that the traditional model of relying on team of good teacher is unlikely to work because they are not adequate number of good teachers. So the second priority which I would recommend in my area to make a large impact would be to empower child with the things which enable him or her to learn on her own, even with a modest quality teacher. And there's a whole net of list of things which are relevant in the field of school education, which work. And believe me, that takes not 100 million, it can take probably 100 billion rupees. And that's the kind of a thing which probably are required when you want to talk about 220 million children every year studying in this school. No, I'd like to uh, just add that on on one hand we uh, definitely need uh, thousands of women at the local level who act on behalf of their communities and who basically have the vision to transform their communities. That's one part. But the other is, I think again, uh, measuring the impact of this change which is hardly done. Measuring the impact where women entrepreneurs are actually becoming job creators and revitalizing these economies. We have some figures like nearly uh, 516 crores in the last two years generated value in terms of uh, by these 41,000 women. So the value generated is huge. They are making a huge change in their economies, and this needs to be really measured. Yeah, so I would say Bill Gates on both sides, action and measurement. Thanks. Um, thanks very much for this. Um, I was about to crack a joke, but I don't know. Uh, because, uh, anyhow, the moment we tell about impact in our field, the private sector says that that's exactly what you need to learn from us. And so, yeah, take the process of honesty from our side and give us the process from our side, right? My name is Anamuka and I'm from Salam Bombay Foundation. This is to Hadish okay. and maybe to you as well. Uh, I, um, so I spend, I think, how important do you think it is to sensitize <coughs> not just NGOs in general but also funders who fund us because apart from you know measuring impact in my organization, I spend a lot of time making people know the difference between our outcome, output and impact. So how important does it become for all of us, especially in the NGO sector, to make the funders or because we are a little fun, funding dependent, to know these differences and then to sort of then tell us, okay, I need you to measure this X or Y. And secondly, when we talk about impact, we become very quantitative and number obsessive. Um, so especially when we're working with gender or uh, I work with adolescent education, there are a lot of things which are more qualitative. So how do you then put that within the impact, you know, discourse and say that this is also equally important? I think it uh, it's a struggle. You actually put your uh, put it on the spot in a sense. The um, whole question of empowerment or uh, building leadership. How do you actually institutionalize this process? And we've tried that for a long time. But now, because I think we've done it for long, we can we are able to stand our um, this thing and take a stand and say no. Um, you actually look at um, meet the women. This is how they are empower, empowered, and this is how the transformation takes place. Otherwise, we find that the donors are only interested in sectors. So, what happened in agriculture? How many farmers? So what happened in enterprise, how many enterprises, and what's the income? So that part of the game continues. But here, I think it's clearly that 
education of donors is a must as you go along. Yeah. There's no formula for that. I would say uh, one thing is uh, many years ago when we started, um, it happened by luck when we said no to a large funder and that got publicized around the world and the other people came to us. Because we said very clearly to the funders and which now we say, I mean we, we have very few, actually a lot of people think we have a lot of funders, we have only very few funders that we, we have just, we got three or four funders. We have won zero in any of the beauty contests. We've only, and what we basically said that was, you are putting your money, we are putting our life. Okay. So there is no hierarchy. If truly the hierarchy is the people that we serve are at the highest, then us, then the funding. Funding is just a mechanism. And the question is, again, transforming the hierarchy, saying that are we partners? You are a funder because you want to achieve that much in the impact space. We also want to do this. Right? We all want to reach the same goal. And that is something that I would push for. Because you start, if you're starting off now, so many years, it's, it's worthwhile in the long run to maintain that discipline because then the type of funders that you will attract are extremely long term. It is extremely painful for the first five years. It's okay, but that painful is absolutely uh, what call it as worthwhile. Uh, that came to my mind as you were discussing was uh, should we pick output is it output versus outcome or you know should the thing be if you have a good delivery mechanism you're naturally creating an output and therefore your outcome is a result of that correct and the other thing was uh, outputs are more relatable you know coming from a donor's perspective outputs are more relatable outcomes are not so should we actually say output versus outcome or should we say you know make your delivery mechanism such that your output is good and therefore your outcomes are better <laughs> just quickly uh, i actually don't think that uh, that outcomes are not relatable okay. i think the outcomes can be very relatable uh, they have to put it into the right context I mean. also uh, it's not one output for one outcome, right? I mean, many times several outputs lead to an outcome. So therefore, I, many times I think uh, donors also, we have to interact with them and sort of uh, have a common platform that you agree to, whereas you know what is the output that you're looking for and what is the outcome that you expect to achieve. And I think that's where, that's where the trade But rarely have I seen that, uh, well, I guess, I guess when you're not successful in getting the funding, you know that you haven't really told them what the outcome should be. So, <laughs> I'm just trying to add something. Uh, it is not so difficult to really relate output to the outcome, but you have to know the field. The relationship between output and outcome actually is known to the people who are in the field. And they can pretty much explain. The moment you are seeing this number, what is you call output, actually you are making an impact. So it requires a really deeper understanding of the field that you are working on. Thank you, sir. Thank you to everybody.